That's it. So any questions on analyzers, sample lines, VLCs? Or anything, because it's open for QA. Yeah, anything. Right. We didn't talk about I think one thing I would open up, uh, a lot of times, someone will come, especially for our key and sample lines, a question will come uh, come up, especially like in the summer times, you can run the heat and sample line as it goes out. Rather than the heat going on, you can still run it and see like the data is normal. And it's been it's been our instruction from uh, my department to uh, let people know because you can't be allowed to question under part of safety where it says where it talks about operating under normal conditions, even though the data may seem to suggest that the sample line is working well, because the sample line isn't actually working normally, we would say validate the data, not try to get it that. Just curious, how many upgrades do you, have you done online? We do them online. Uh, it's pretty rare these days. It's, it's, I can't remember the last time we did it. Um, you know, it's only two hours. Something like that, we might be able to get away with it. PLC upgrade. Uh, well, it's you know, so PLC you know, software oh, you know, fix. Like that, so. a, lot of, a lot of this work will take you know, four or five hours of downtime. So. Yeah, it took a full day for. When we did, y'all did ours, but with us, we had enough downtime along. It was fine. Well, a lot of times, from what I'm hearing, it's, it's not even the downtime issue; it's the uh, availability issue. Uh, if you're getting paid to be available, and there's work being done, you get in big trouble if you're not available. Uh, so they don't take that chance. It's just you need to be available. Period. But your question, Scott, was you had to switch out while the unit's running. Right. Not, so the unit is still available, but it's still running. Yeah. That's just, yeah, just run it for launch. There's different interpretations of that because I've talked to people about that. <laughs> and they go, if we don't have an emission system, it's not available. No. Now, that's their interpretation, not necessarily yours, but that's what we're running into. Yeah. Is we need a fully compliant system with an emission system that's fully admitted. Well, I think it matters what your state regulations are, yeah, what sure. you're dealing with. Right. If, your if your regulator is okay with doing the switch out while you're running, then you're available. If we switch it, if you go to California where they say we can, then that makes us unavailable. Right. I guess it's not available. Well, and it's even harder when you go to South Coast because it's, you don't have any clue. We don't have South Coast people. In the South Coast, the SEMS is always on. Whether your unit's running or not, the SEMS is always collecting data. It's averaging those data. They're changing that now. Yeah, I know they are, but they haven't yet. And so uh, as, as they changed the new stuff, that was always the caveat. We had a plant that got an excess emission when the plant wasn't running because their CO emissions exceeded because of the cars that were driving by on the high traffic. City of Burbank. Because they ended that plant, you know where the stack is and where the highway is. They were right next to each Brian Resick and I used to watch the data. When the plant wasn't running, we could tell you when rush hour. <laughs> we watch the CO data. It was pretty amazing. Hey, hey Bob, a couple years ago, you did a presentation on how you adjust the, the DAS, adjust the data after calibration. You did the whole graph and all that stuff. <laughs> There's a fist on that data. No, <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of my technicians um, is. His old system, I guess, and I don't know the details. I'm going by what I was told, but so, so the the, the analyzers measure the data, that the DAS adjusts it based on the calibration of information, and that's the data that's stored in the system. Yes. The technicians are really interested. They say it's helpful to troubleshoot if you can get to the raw data as well. Is that stored in the system? It is stored. Mm -hmm. Okay. We, we yeah, that, that we was. always store both. Because I thought most of that was kind of newer. Yeah, yeah, so they, we've been doing it for the last 10 years or so. If not, then you can change that. So that How do you access it? Uh, one of them is called Cal Corrective Data or non Cal Corrective Data. Okay. It's in CDR. So it's in CDR? Is that displayed on real users? Yes. It's corrected versus non corrected. Yes. Yeah. I know it's displayed, but I didn't know if it was Cal. Yeah, and that's the only way we can display it if we have one there. Okay. It's it. It's okay. Yeah. It, Part of the rationale is 
that's how we make that issue. You have to do one of two things. You either have to say what the correction factor was and store it, or you have to store the two data points and then you know the correction factor is after the fact. Well, it's much easier for us to just store two data points and then store the, and then figure out what the correction factor is after the fact is being big than it is to just store the correction. Factor. Sure. That's a lot easier to do. Yeah, they should both be there. And they should be labeled as such. And back to the point, if you weren't here a couple of years ago when Bob did this presentation, he was funny because he came and he said, well, this is only like five minutes long. I said, believe me, <laughs> we don't have to worry about it. An hour and a half into the discussion, we finally had to stop because there could have been people fighting about this. <laughs> there was physically fighting about it. it was, it's a very uh, touchy subject for a lot of people. By the way, there is a switch to turn that off. So if you don't want cal correction, you just go ahead and turn it off, and then it doesn't happen. So if you don't want that analyzer to be, or excuse me, the data to be cal correct, right. it'll turn it off. And for those of you that don't know what we're talking about, Len will write a book. Probably going to be busted. We'll write something up and put it on the website about what Cal correction is so you can have it, so you know what that is, what it means. Uh, basically, what it amounts to is the analyzer basically has a zero and span value every day. It zeroes it back out. So one of the things that uh, there was a company that did it on the fly. It, anyway, it doesn't matter. It was an analyzer company. And every day their analyzer would adjust itself. Well, now you're adjusting something that's already been adjusted. <laughs> And so it would never work. Before we do the calibration every day, it goes back to uh, slope and intercept at one and zero. So you have that value back to its native state. Then once you get a span of zero value, then it can tweak that number based on that linearization. And so that's how that calculation works. And it kind of went bad name because they kept correcting the <laughs> yeah, and, and there was a company that was doing that. It was like, oh my God, we never did. Yeah, because it was corrected every day. It was like, oh. But you no, know, we go back to its zero state, to its base state before the count every day. Instead and then it's readjusted. Back to one when we would count. Right. And so that's how it's adjusted every day. But we'll, we'll write something up and put it on the website because that's a pretty good topic. That yeah, I like the already It's heated and then we kind of give you a little background. So, well, you mentioned water baths a little bit ago. I, I, That's a lot specialty. I'm here to talk about those too. So, um, we've had a couple of issues over the years where I think it's a, some kind of switch fails and we freeze the water bath. Um, so, my question is, how, you know, can we, when you guys install those, can you put in the, the right, I, I might get the terminology wrong, the appropriate thermocouples that we can put an alarm on it for low temperature? This has come up a few times, yeah. low temperature, and maybe you went to help me out on this one. Um, the problem with low temperature is that, you know, fat was operating around 36, 38 degrees. So, freezing temperature is 32. Okay. So, you don't have a whole lot of measurement um, there that you can really tell where, where it's going to be a problem. Uh, once it's frozen, you're just going to use 32. Well, I, the, 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 what, the, the issue is, is when it freezes, and I know we get you get low pressure alarms and low flow alarms, all that stuff, and we're aware of it. But at right. that time, your analyzer is reading whatever air is in there, and we've had to report deviations based on, you know, like you said, the, the Burbank thing. So um, one of our plants on their own, they installed a, a, an alarm at 33 degrees to give the techs enough time to react to it before it freezes solid, so we don't have a compliance reporting. Is that a Baytown plant here? Russell City. Okay. Yeah. Baytown asked me about it, and I said, well, yeah. you give it a shot. So, yeah. so, I mean, we're in, the, we're in the process of having all of our plants put in that system. And I don't I know that there may have been some communication with you guys, and I know, you know, we don't want it to go high because then you have a, a you have a, an equipment problem on the, on, the, on the equipment end. But from a compliance standpoint, it's important that we catch it before it freezes solid because then we're, we're not reading emissions and we're reading who knows what. Well, we've had a couple of ours freeze up too, and it's not only a compliance issue. I mean, I yeah. <laughs> but uh, the tubes have cracked too. Yeah. Maybe when they need to get a sample from the back. We put Ranco um, from 
control them. Like you said, digital control, and I believe they have an output. For Is that right? Okay. okay. So I'm just replacing this with the old mechanical um, bulb sensor. Look, where Eric had suggested that. the sensor in order to detect that for you. It's, it's the same it's the same as your bulb at the same time. Yeah, it's it's just not it's what, no, no, it's it's no, on. It's the same, same as where your sensing bulb was for your mechanical. Okay. It's yeah, just well, going just, the same thing. That's just stuck out of the water. Because you don't get fluid. You're going to freeze. You'll start freezing around the right. copper coils. Just yeah. Out. So you this was just measuring, well, measuring the back temperature. You're saying you took the bulb out and replaced, replaced it, with it with a new rank coat temperature. Uh -huh. That's what Eric was suggesting. So yeah, we'll right. Right. Go to so there's a new digital style. Rank, rank, Ranko, I believe is the brand, and uh, it's just a digital controller. Um, you can change your hysteresis, so if you just want it to go up and down one or two degrees from your set point, you can do that. And I, if I remember correctly, I believe it had an alarm output, so don't quote me. So we put that in um, our SUNAS site and our Anchogen site. Yeah, you want a high end or low, then. Yeah, but as far as the warm up, like the hysteresis would go yeah, it's down true. plus or minus true. three. All these or whatever you set off. Yep. R A N C O, I believe. Right, right. I'm just curious, I mean, how much does that, is it a benefit? Because it keeps, once it keeps, it's not going to take that long to freeze. So once it freezes, you still have the same problem. Right, unless there's a long, that would be it's just. Right. Keep it and just to, to catch it before it freezes solid, so you don't have both equipment and compliance issues. So that that'd be great if we could make that standard or as far as the. the I'll look at that. I'll look at the very controller. Mm -hmm. I was looking for the first solution. Okay. Yeah. 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 You know, I, I'll just go out on a limb here. I went to Cambalachi, Puerto Rico. Their water baths were 23 years old. We replaced them with brand new ones, and they were still running. That's how reliable that water bath is. Yeah. Yeah, we haven't any issues except for the cracking on the corners, so you'll to keep level. Because if it froze, you don't need to. Yeah, a lot of times what happens is on the cooler. We had a period of time when we had a brand new guy in the shop and he didn't put nuts underneath the bottom side of the crack. And it cracked because somebody stood on it. I lived all of it for the most part. We did that. It was just somebody who did that. Yeah, that was a big boy. Yeah, that was a big boy. We brought her leaf crack, two of them, and both of them freezing. Huh. Um, now, one, we had a local HVAC shop repair. Which tubes are you talking about? The, the, the coolant tube? The, oh, in the water itself. Oh, the Teflon tubes? No, in the water. Copper tube. Copper tube. Yeah, that's, that's the first time I've ever heard that. Huh. I mean, we, we've thrown multiple times. Two of those caused damage. The other time. Okay. So I think it's something to prevent the control or the control leads would benefit. Do you know why you have to rename it because of stipulation or because of the control issue? I think it's because of that, that dinking switch is a, uh, you know, the hysteresis is off. Or, uh, we've had to change those, most of those switches and other things to control them. Those, those uh, we've always had problems with those not staying, uh, uh, they either swing too much or they, you know, or something. Yeah, because you can change your system. Well, you know, you in, in a Cisco system, we've always had two stages of drying. We have the primary dryer, which is the refrigeration cooler, or a water bath, or a thermal electric cooler. And then we put downstream and add a memory dryer, radiation tube device. Okay? So the dew point of the sample reaching the analyzer is in the minus 20. <coughs> Degree range, okay, depending on how dry your instrument air is. The better the drier than what your instrument air is. But if your instrument air is minus 40 at 
that sample viewpoint is going to be minus 20 plus or minus if you want to go down even further, okay? So that eliminates the criticality of running your primary dryer at two degrees above freezing. You can run that dryer uh, refrigeration cool cold water bath at 40 degrees. And as long as the internal temperature of the shelter in their case to 39 degrees, you won't get any condensation as it passes through the pump and the filter and whatnot. And when it gets to the membrane dryer, the membrane dryer will take the rest of the sink and moisture out into the gaseous phase. So uh, all our sample data are set at 40. It's set at 40. Okay. Well, that's like I say, I think that's reason that we saw this, you know, failing in some way. But uh, I've had people who try to set it right down to, you know, 35 degrees or more. something much closer to that. And it's not necessary unless you've got the secondary dryer in this area. How important would you say the placement of that circulation pump is? Yeah. yeah. Once that circulation pump stops, now you've got dead water. And uh, yeah, you can freeze at that point. Have you had circulation pump failures? We have. We, we have had a couple of those failures. Yeah. Yeah. Not too many of those. They're just a little fish tank. Don't put fish in there. Yeah. Throw vinegar on there to clean it up. You know, the water. We have a recommendation that we replace those pumps. I mean, no. Well, you stop working and put it in there. Yeah, you stop working. I guess you replace once a year if it's a failure and it fail. Let's have a cold water bath come back 17 years. We recondition it. Put a new fan in it because it wasn't cool. Put a new fan in it, we put it at 40, and it read about 37 degrees. So it, it, it varies, you know, on that temp controller, three, four degrees. Well, I like the, the point about the alarm because, um, you know, we at work, heating station, and uh, we have a small staff, so we're not manned 24 7. So if it's a long weekend and they have a failure on a Friday night, it could be Tuesday morning before someone comes in and sees the big block of ice, right? But it, you still get an alarm, but it may not be as critical. Uh, but you, you would get the back. But they would hit the alarm, well, um, it depends on if our Sioux Falls disconnect. Oh, wow. If they get an alarm and uh, before it freezes, then they have time for the dispatcher to call the guy out and come in and do something before it before it hits the yeah, we'll, we'll look into it. it. We need to figure out something that's actually more good system. Great system. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Any other questions? We, we're, we're, we're over time, but it's the same time to so. Well, one of them I was just going to bring up to Charlie was talking about uh, correcting and correction. Uh, just a reminder when you guys think about brought up Brandon, um, whenever you guys question go to your under part 75 to make sure before you run your radar setting the bias back to one. Otherwise, you're just biasing the bias if you keep. Well, that's a I good point. Before you go back to that point, the raw data is in the database and you can't read yeah, the yes. report. Yes. Yes. Uh, <laughs> it's not like you have to rerun the rat, but you will have to rerun the report. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but a lot of times, it's like most people who don't catch it, they submit it to re the rebiased body, is, no, no, no. but they can't, they don't have to rerun the head. Right. More questions? I got, I got two more. Okay. Um, so when the system goes into calibration, it sends a signal to the DCS that the analyzer's in calibration, correct? Um, and so a lot of our sites, we have an SCR NOx analyzer, which is a, a separate set of calibrations. 
I, I'm any at Cisco. Are you aware that we that you would send different signals to the to the to the DCS um, depending on which system is in calibration, or is it always just a single signal? Because because what happens is um, you know the the DCS is getting the signal that the system is in calibration, and therefore our um, our NOx control system is is off, right? But in reality, when the SCR NOx analyzer is in calibration, we would like it to not to to to, to start using the staff NOx analyzer to help control our, our NOx or you know regulating ammonia flow. And we've had some compliance issues because you're in calibration for 30 minutes and you're right on the edge. You don't have enough minutes to get out of it, to average it back into compliance. Yeah, it's case by case. I mean, a lot of times those signals can be dictated by the AD that's the signal we want to do CS. Right. Um, but but have you have you seen it, it, two different signals? Yeah. If I see a requirement for you know we want to keep in cal and it's the SCR system and the Thursday system, then there's two signals on the SCR cal. Two separate systems. So there should, should be two separate systems. Can you control a program your PID controller to control on those two different values because the SCR inlet knocks doing the higher concentration much faster response. It's going to be a very short concentration. It's going to be downstream in time. Yeah, you have a feedback loop. So you're just hoping your control would have that program in it. Right. I, I mean, every plant's different, but the SCR NOx usually isn't used in the, in the control system. It's, you know, it's not. Not typically, I don't think. No. I mean, that, the SCR box is, value is probably not changing, but if you change load and you don't put in more ammonia, then all of a sudden your your, your staff NOx is, is going to go high, right? And that's our challenge. We come out of calibration, and instead of a two or a three, we've got ten more minutes to get under two, and we can't we can't do it. And so, if we could save seven minutes of calibration time to to be back in normal ops when the SCR NOx analyzer is in calibration, that would that would really be helpful. I always understood the reason we had an SCR NOx analyzer was a primary control for your ammonia injection. I think you could use the stack as a trim, but we use it to calculate ammonia slip in most places. Well, yeah. well just to calculate just to calculate it, slip, not to regulate it. Yeah. But no, you're right. I mean, we lots of different ways to do it. Turners yeah. usually use that for turning the engine. So it's we use so, I mean, who who should I talk to to see about? I don't even. And this is this is out of my out of my realm of expertise. I don't know about DCS signals and what's going on down the pool. So. Uh, I'll throw him under the Start with Brian. Okay. <laughs> and then uh, from Brian, we can go from there. He'll he'll direct it to the necessary people. So that that's what happens when you don't show up. I know, I know he's here, <laughs> and I know he can hear me. So, for those of you who don't know Brian, Brian's our uh, software guru on the configuration side, the customer support side, and Brian used to have a ponytail that looks sort of kind of like Maggie uh, Joe. Brian doesn't have a ponytail. I saw him the other day; it's all gone. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And I've known Brian for a long time. He's had that ponytail the whole time. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, he doesn't have it anymore. I don't know. Well, 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 a lot, of, a lot of times the signals aren't um, indicated by the AD and, and yeah. we, we may not even put those signals in. We have just a SCR NOx and invalid signal, which is kind of the same thing, basically the same thing. Or we won't even have that. And what we do is we hold the signal, of the, you know, the SCR NOx during calibration, so we don't have to jump. Now it's up to and we probably, you know, once we understand that, then we'll have to go back to the DCS and, and make some adjustments there probably. Well, research all that. Okay, good. So my, my last thing, um, and I think this is something we talked with, with Brian 
with Brian before, but um, you know, you guys are logging into our system on occasion. Whenever um, is there a way in the DAS to to log when people dial in and when changes get made? I mean, that's something that we are interested in. I don't know. I don't know if it's available or. We've done it in the past. It's a manual function that okay. we do. Uh, we've done it, and usually it's because we put a little notepad in there or something like that to yeah. log those changes in there. Uh, it's a question that, that's come up numerous times, and I brought it up one year, and it was dead silence in the room, and they said no. Uh, but an electronic logbook of some sort. And, you know, of course, that was six years ago, so now we're six years down the road, and maybe now is the time an electronic logbook. I mean, we specifically, we've got log books out of the shack, but it's log books for what goes on on the right. right. ass. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll explore that. Uh, I'll get with the software group and we'll see what we can do to make sure that that happens. Uh, they have protocols back home where if they make changes to the configuration files of the PLC, they have to record what those changes were into their uh, historian, just to what, where they check in and check out the programs so that we have the latest version and we don't want to change Okay. That's their protocol now. Uh, doing that on site is, would just be one added layer, and they're going to do the same thing. So if they type it on your system, you copy it, paste it back into their system, you don't really have to do it twice. So we could definitely add something. I'll, I'll be able to do this. Super. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Well, we're time. Thanks for taking the time to come this year. Uh, it's a weird year. Uh, last year was weirder, but it was weirder <laughs> because none of us were here. Uh, but uh, hopefully next year we'll be back to a little bit more normal. We have some uh, ideas to improve uh, this week, uh, every year. And so if you have any ideas, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Uh, and if you don't know my email address, just get on our website for the info and send it, and it comes to me. Uh, and I'll get it there. And any suggestions that you have will be uh, if you have topics that you'd like to see, uh, it has been suggested that we have breakout sessions. I was going to do that this year, but I knew we were going to have limited attendance, and I didn't see that that was uh, a good year to start that process. So we'll probably do that next year, where there'll be some hardware, there'll be some software, and some breakout sessions. We'll probably expand it to two days in order to accomplish that. But I think uh, all in all, people will be uh, pretty pleased by those changes. We do have the training classes going on back at Cisco in the next couple of days. Analyzer training was yesterday and tomorrow, and then repeated again on Thursday and Friday for those who signed up for the later class. And then uh, software training starts tomorrow. That's at Cisco as well. So we have a uh, Cisco uh, thing going on back there. We do ask you to bring your mask with you when you come into the building. We have a lot of workers that are in there, and they haven't agreed to all of you being in there. And so, if you wear a mask when you're inside the building, that would be ideal. Uh, so that probably has a form for you to fill out. Uh, yeah. When you show up in the building in the morning, just a quick fill out the form for sign your name and everything's good when you go to the building. It's all locked when you get over there, but a lot of people watch in the door early in the morning so uh, they can let you in and make sure everything's handled okay. All right. Thanks for coming. Uh, if you want some hummus, there's plenty over here. <laughs> <laughs>